So thank you again, everybody, for making yourself available for this uh, uh, talk within our AI seminars at TII. As you know, we are we're organizing roughly every two weeks uh, AI seminars uh, related to the activity that we're doing here at TII. I'm very pleased that uh, 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 Professor Alessio Figali accepted to uh, give a seminar uh, within our, our, our series and remotely. I hope also that uh, we'll have the opportunity to welcome him uh, within our, our, our center uh, in the next months when uh, the situation of COVID gets better. So I had the opportunity to know uh, Alessio already in my former life when, uh, when, uh, when uh, uh, and even actual life in the Lagrange Center in Paris that I established. And, and we've been at that time already interacting and, and, and discussing very closely together. So I'm quite happy that, that he get, decided to give the talk and especially on a topic which is of high interest today within the connection of, I would say, machine learning AI, which is called optimal transport. Uh, uh, so optimal transport, he'll explain, has been there for many years. It's a, a, a whole framework and tool that has been developed already in the 18th century. And he'll give an overview and you'll understand also why it's so important today, especially for people working in computer vision. As far as Alessio Figali is concerned, I don't think I need to introduce him. Uh, he has a great career. He's been working uh, in uh, fundamental applied mathematics, having many awards. And one of the most prestigious award is of course the medal fields that he won in 2018 for his contribution to the theory of optimal transport and its application to partial differential equations, metric geometry and for mobility. And as you all know, uh, um, he's been also interacting with other middle fields in the field, which are also known for the work uh, within that kind of, 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 of directions, which are also Professor Cédric Villani and uh, uh, also Pierre Rillion that we had uh, a couple of months ago, both being middle fields. So uh, Alessio, I'm quite happy that you accepted. And also I look forward also for the close collaboration because I'm happy also to announce that you are in the board of, of, of TII in the AI Center. So this is also very good for us. And we hope to increase our collaborations with the kickstart of, of this uh, seminar series done by you. Take care. And it, the floor is yours. OK, thank you very much, Beruan. And let me say that it's a big pleasure for me to be at least virtually here with all of you. Um, so today, I would like to present optimal transport theory. It's a theory that is uh, very dear to me. I've been working on it for many, many years. And what I would like to do in this presentation is to describe a bit what optimal transport is. Um, I will uh, give some formulas here and there to just give you a sense of mathematically how you set up the problem, what are some important contributions. I will select some few applications which are more of first of mathematical taste, and then I will move also to uh, the, let's say, the real present and future, which I think is uh, in machine learning. So uh, to start really with, the, let's say, the beginning of the story, the, everything started with Gaspar Monge in France. So we are uh, roughly at the end of the 18th century, let's say during French Revolution and then with Napoleon, uh, Monge wanted to find the cheapest way of building fortifications. What do I mean by that? It means that you have the material that has been extracted from the ground. You know that you have fortifications, you know where your fortifications should be, let's say across Europe. And uh, you wanna know um, which part of the material should go where in order to minimize the transportation cost. So it's an optimization problem. And uh, uh, when you talk about optimal transport, you always have to specify the transportation cost. If you change the cost, the problem changes. And for Monge, a natural choice of the cost was the travel distance, which means that if I have to transport one kilogram of material between two cities which are 100 kilometers apart, I will pay 100. If they are 1,000 kilometers apart, I will pay 1,000. That was the modeling chosen by Monge. And the contribution by Monge has been very important. He gave a lot of uh, fundamental contributions about the geometry of optimal transport. And for his work, he's been really considered one of, let's say, the father of optimal transport. But unfortunately, let's say after Monge, this problem was a bit forgotten. There have been some, still some important contributions for, for several years, but nothing, let's say, um, so fundamental until 150 years later. So 150 years later, Kantorovich in Russia came into play. And essentially what Kantorovich did was to find a new way of um, formulating Monge problem. It's a matter of mathematical formulation. I will come to that. 
but the basic idea of Kantorovich is that you want to find a mathematical framework where you can say that if I have a certain amount of material in one location, this amount of material doesn't necessarily need to go all in the same location, in, a, in another location which has to be the same for everyone. And the kind of, uh, let's say, economical examples where you see that this is very natural is like if you have bakeries and coffee shops, like in this picture, um, a single bakery will produce a certain amount of bread. Each coffee shop will require a certain amount of bread. And then the, uh, you have to draw arrows to make sure that each coffee shop um, gets the, the bread that requires. Each bakery is able to get rid of all its own bread. And you want to do this in the cheapest possible way, where again, cheapest is just about transportation cost. So here there is no, uh, let's say, competition in terms of, the, you know, breads could cost uh, differently or coffee shops could put different prices. This is like more of a, uh, you know, um, let's see, kind of communist model where everyone pays the same, everyone gets the same. We want to maximize the global utility and the global utility is the total transportation cost of this problem. Um, Kantorovich got the Nobel Prize in Economics for this work, uh, together with Kupman in 75. But let's say this remained still an economics problem. And in order to become a mathematical problem, we had to wait still for all their 40 years, roughly 45 years, with uh, Brenier and Rachendusch Ruschendorf, who, like, um, they provided the first really deep mathematical theorems that got that allowed also people to get interested in it because mathematicians were missing, I think, the, the richness of the problem. And it's through the contribution of these mathematicians that people realized that optimal transport could be more than a simple economic problem. So mathematically, you have a cost function, C of X, Y, so which is the cost of transporting one particle from location X to location Y. And given such a cost that, again, you have to choose it, depending on the, on the problem you're studying, you want to minimize the total transportation cost among all possible transport maps. So you have maps T that map that move points X into point Y. And then among all possible maps, you want to minimize the cost. Uh, naturally, you have to ask yourself, am I looking about something makes sense in the sense that a lot of transport map exist? Uh, it's not obvious. There could be infinitely many transport maps. So you are minimizing over infinite dimensional space. And also, can we understand how it looks like? That's very important because if you want to use it in applications, you need to know a bit about the structure of it, uh, especially if then you want to find you know, numerical ways of computing it. Um, let me just, you know, uh, for the sake of completeness, even if many parts of the talk will not need it, but let me give also some mathematical definitions. So mathematically, what is a transport map? So mathematically, we think of our distribution that we want to transport as probability measures. So you have a measure mu, is your, which represents the amount of mass you want to transport. You assume that it has total mass one, it's just a normalization. And then mu describe the, the distribution of the target measure. And then we say that a transport map, T is a transport map, if mathematically we say the push forward of mu to the map T is equal to mu. And this can be written via change of variable, which is like the integral of every test function against new is equal to the integral against every test function composed with T um, in respect to mu. Um, that's uh, just a, mat you know, a, a way to define it. But um, it's important to know that there is also a, a, like a differential characterization of transport map, which is through the determinant. So another way that you have a, to say that you have a transport map is to say that the determinant of the gradient of the map uh, in fact, the modulus of it, but in most cases, the determinant will actually be positive. Um, it's equal to the ratio between the density of the first measure, mu, and the second measure composed, composed with mu, with t. So here, uh, it's an abuse of notation. I'm thinking that mu and mu are functions, not measures here. Um, so just to say, there are many ways of saying transport maps. There is a weak formulation, but also you can write it in a, as a partial differential equation to characterize a being, being a transport. Okay, um, this is just the setting. And then what do you have? You have a transportation cost, C, X, Y. Then to trans the transportation to move one point from X to T of X will be C of X, T of X. And then you just integrate this against the total measure mu. And this is the total transportation cost. 
So this is the, the formula for the total transportation cost. So you want to minimize the total transportation cost. And uh, I'm gonna use the notation WC, oh, sorry, WC to define the minimal cost with respect to C uh, to move mu into mu. So WC mu nu means the, the they say the vastest W recalls a name which is a Russian name Wasserstein because of some historical reasons that I will not discuss. But let's say this this kind of cost are named after Wasserstein. So WC is the Wasserstein cost with respect to the cost C to transport mu into mu. Um, this is Monge problem. Now, in, if you use Monge problem, um, you have a lot of problems in reality because it's difficult to prove that the minimizer exists. Uh, it's difficult to prove, uh, actually, it's even difficult to prove that uh, there exists a single transport map. So the set of transport maps could be empty in some cases. And also, you don't see even a, a sim, there is not much symmetry between mu and new. So transporting mu to new and transporting new to mu is not very symmetric in this formulation. So this is why Kantorovich comes, comes into play, because in Kantorovich makes it more probabilistic. Well, in, there are many ways of formulating it, but he formulated it as a, a symmetric way. So you take all, so you have two probability distributions. You, you take all possible variables, X and Y, which have low random variables, X and Y, so that the low of X is, is mu, the low of Y is new. And then you minimize a sort of correlation between them, the correlation measured with respect to the cost. Um, this, uh, in the particular case where Y is X, T composed with X, you recover Monge. So Monge would be a particular case of this. It's the case where Y is dependent on the, the variable, random variable Y is dependent on the random variable X via map T. Um, and uh, this defines another transportation cost, which is now symmetric in X and Y, because you see that there is no particular role between X and Y. Well, the symmetry could come from the cost, but let's say if the cost is symmetric, then the, the distance is symmetric. And in fact, the model case in most cases is uh, X minus Y square. So this, the model square is a very good model case for many applications. Um, but it's just to say that there is another formulation and this formulation is much more robust. So people in numerical application like a lot Kantorovich, they will not use much, they will work with Kantorovich. Um, and this makes a very nice actually linear programming problem that you can solve. Um, so Kantorovich found this different formulation, great. Uh, but uh, then mathematically, you would still like to know more about uh, the, also the Monge problem. So it's easy to solve Kantorovich, but what about Monge? And the, the, I mentioned to you that Brenier contribution was very relevant. In fact, Brenier in 1991 solved the Monge problem for the quadratic cost. So what Brenier said is that if the cost is X minus Y square in a REN, so you are in a nice flat space, quadratic cost, and you assume that mu is a density, so it means that uh, it's uh, you know it's absolutely continuous with respect to the Lebesgue measure. Um, then there exists a unique optimal transport map T, so the transport map exists is unique, and not only that, it's given by the gradient of a convex function. So, um, so you see, transport maps are maps from a REN to a REN. So. Uh, these are like change of variables. And what turns out is that for optimal maps for quadratic cost, there exists a, a function, so not a, a vectorial function, but a scalar function phi, which is convex, whose gradient coincides with T. So um, why this is useful? Because this is a nice there is a nice corollary to it. The nice corollary is an abstract theorem, which has nothing to do with optimal transport. It just says that if you give me a, a probability measure which has a density, so it's absolutely continuous with respect to the back, then there exists a convex function phi whose gradient sends mu to mu. So the corollary, the, in the corollary, there is no optimal transport. The corollary is just a, a, a formula, uh, sorry, a change of variable statement that tells you that you can always transport at absolutely continuous density onto any density you want, any measure you want with the gradient of a convex function. Um, how do you prove the corollary? Well, you just take mu and nu, you look at the most problem for mu and nu with quadratic cost, you solve it, you apply Brenier theorem, and you go back. But the corollary is not an optimal transport statement. Um, 
I wanted to emphasize this because I would like to show you one, I think, very nice application of um, still a mathematical one, but I think, uh, I mean, to me is very dear because uh, it has been a starting point of a, uh, of a big chunk of my work, um, but also it shows why sometimes optimal transport could have a big role. And in addition, the fact that there is a gradient of a convex function, uh, this is used sometimes also in machine learning to construct optimal maps. So there are, there are ways like um, what are called convex neural networks that are, they are allowed to create convex functions. And so the fact of having some convex function behind it could also be useful in some applications. So uh, there are people who exploit this fact. So I thought it would anyhow fit um, in the theory. So just very briefly, let me just uh, say in one, in just one slide that total transport is really, really uh, ubiquitous by now. So it has a lot of applications. There are obvious ones like urban planning. Okay, it came as a, as a natural problem of allocation of transporting resources. So of course, in urban planning, you can use optimal transport. But uh, there are applications which, which perhaps are more surprising. I will discuss a bit also the one in meteorology. Um, but then you can go on. Um, it has been used in image processing very naturally. But then it can be used uh, now. Right now in machine learning, it has become more and more. Um, important tool. And I think it's just the beginning of that. So um, before going there, let me show you a nice problem that you can solve with optimal transport, just to show you, uh, give you a sense of why people realized that optimal transport could be more than just an economic problem. Um, so I start with a different state problem, completely different. This is called the isoperimetric problem. The superimetric problem is the following. So uh, you have a, given a certain volume, what is the least surface area needed to enclose it? Okay. So you want, you have an object of let's say certain amount of volume and you want to understand what is the best shape to enclose a certain volume. And uh, the answer to this question is well known when you watch at soap bubbles, the best shape to enclose a certain amount of volume is the sphere. And there is a reason, because when, we, when you blow air inside the soap bubble, the soap bubbles um, detaches from the, the, the ring, the plastic ring over which there is the soap film, right? So there is the soap film, we blow air in it, the, the soap bubble detaches, and then very quickly converges to a sphere. This is from physical principle because a soap bubble wants to minimize the energy tension. And the energy tension is like the perimeter, is the surface. So it's just a physical principle that makes it converge to the sphere. So this means spheres are the best object in terms of um, area to volume ratio. And uh, mathematically, this can be written through a, a very fundamental inequality that tells you that if you give me a domain E, like the one on the left, this red, object, uh, the perimeter of E, so the area of the boundary, controls the volume. More precisely, the perimeter of E is greater or equal than N, N being the dimension, the volume of the unit ball to the power one over N, and then the volume of the set to the power N minus one over N. So this is the formula. Uh, it's a sharp formula because if E is a ball, you have equality. And uh, so you see that if you fix the volume of E, the right hand side is fixed, and then the perimeter is always greater or equal than a certain amount. And the least possible perimeter you get it when you get the quality. So the ball is the best set in terms of shape. Um, so this is a, a fundamental inequality which has been known now since decades. And the beauty is that this inequality can be proven via optimal transport. So I think uh, the proof of this is a very beautiful proof, but also it shows a way to use optimal transport in an area where you don't see much of it. Um, so the idea is the following. You have objects like E and B. E is, an, uh, is, a, is a set, B1 is another set, is the ball. So your object e is an abstract object. You don't know how it looks like, but it is given. And then you know by optimal transport that you can transport probability measures. So how do you associate to a set a probability measure? Well, you just put constant density inside the, the domain E. 
So inside E, you put a constant density. Inside B1, you put another constant density. So you just built two probability measures which have uniform density inside these two sets. And then you apply Brignier theorem, and you find a map that transports the first measure to the second measure. Um, this exists. We don't care how it looks like. We know that is the gradient of a convex function. Great. Now we have few properties of these maps, which are all very elementary. The first one is that the modulus of the map T, the transport map, is bounded by one. And this is uh, clear because if you take any point in E, its image is in B1. And the unit ball is the set of points by definition which have norm less than one. So that's very easy. The property B is the, is the change of variable formula that I told you a few slides before. Being a transport map can be written in terms of a determinant condition, determinant of gradient of T equals something. In this particular case, that's what you get. So B just means T is a transport map. A just means I'm mapping into B1. And then there is a third relation, which is perhaps a bit more mysterious, but is actually very easy as well. This will come in a second that relates the divergence of T to the determinant of the gradient. So these are three informations on the transport map that you can easily get. And then you just say, okay, the, sorry, um, sorry, went too fast. Tuck. Okay, so the perimeter of my set E by definition is the integral over the boundary of one is the area of the boundary. But then by property A, I can replace one with the modulus of T. And then the modulus of the transport map is greater than if I take the scalar product between T and the unit normal to the set, just because the unit normal is modulus one. So a scalar product between two vectors is always less frequent than the modulus of the vectors. But the, the nice thing is that the last term I wrote is the flux of a vector field. And then I can use Stokes' theorem that tells me that um, the flux is the inter of the divergence. And then I can apply C to relate divergence and determinant. But then by property B, I know what is the determinant. And I'm done. So two lines and you have the inequality. So uh, again, I'm not, is, the point here is not really the inequality by itself. Immediately, I will mention some application, but is also how optimal transport comes as a tool, a black box, you plug it in, it allows you to do some manipulations and then you end up with the right result, which is the first term and the last term. In between there is an optimal transport, but you see it has nothing to do with the problem itself. You just found a smart way to insert optimal transport in the proof. Um, this is a very beautiful proof, uh, first introduced by Knote and then rediscovered by Gromov. And, um, it has been very powerful. I will comment a moment later in the in about its applications. But what I want to uh, to finish this, I still didn't mention how you get C property C, and this is where you use that T is a gradient of a convex function. Uh, why you have to prove this? Well, because T is the gradient of phi. So now you denote by lambda one to lambda n the eigenvalues of the Hessian of phi. So H, phi is a convex function. So the Hessian is a symmetric matrix, symmetric matrix which has no negative eigenvalues because of convexity. And then, so you have this number lambda one, lambda n at each point. So this is the convexity. And then you see that the divergence, if you just write explicitly what it is, is the n times the arithmetic mean of the eigenvalues. And then you know that the arithmetic mean on non-negative numbers is greater equal to the geometric mean on non-negative numbers. And that's it. So that's how you relate divergence to determinant. It's really just an arithmetic geometric inequality. Um, so all the proof is extremely short and, and uh, beautiful. Uh, of course, as it is now, it looks that I only reproved something that was already known. So uh, perhaps it's a bit weak as an application. But in reality, we could push this much further. Uh, just to mention you, so uh, this kind of argument that you use to model the shape of um, spheres, let's say the shape of so bubbles, you can rip, you, if you change a bit the formulas, you can use it to model crystals as well. 
So there, is a, there are formulas that are similar to the one of the perimeters and the volume, as I just said, uh, a bit more, um, not, not much more complicated, but just more variants that allow you to describe crystals as minimizers of some certain surface tension. So if you take the classical surface tension, the uniform perimeter, you get ball. If you change the surface tension according to some molecular structure, you get different kinds of crystalline shapes. This is something that was already discovered by uh, Gibbs and then Wolf more than 100 years ago. Essentially, you, droplets, so bubbles, crystals, they're all part of the same mathematical principle. They minimize surface tension at fixed volume. Just the surface tension changes depending on the object you look at. And uh, so there are inequalities for each of these objects. But in, in reality, in, in physics, in nature, uh, these inequalities are, are all very abstract. They're all very, um, uh, let's say, idealistic. Because in reality, every object we see in nature, they, it will be subject to some forces. Like if I take a soap bubbles, there will be gravity. There could be wind. The temperature is not ideal. Depending on the temperature, the shape could change. There are several forces that act on a system, on a physical system. And the question is, can I quantify, can I understand how the change in energy affects the shape of the system? So um, the idea is that assume that now we give a bit of energy to the system. For instance, I raise the temperature, just as an example. Then the, the, the shape changes. Can I quantify how much? So you have the ideal crystal, let's say a, a pentagon. This is like the perfect crystal. And then there will be a more uh, physical crystals, perhaps the one on the right. I don't know if it's very physical in this picture, but there will be another crystal, which is the crystal I see in nature once I raise the energy of the system by epsilon. Epsilon being a certain amount of temperature I'm giving to the system. And I want to quantify the change in shape in terms of epsilon. So this is kind of question. Um, and this is something we, that has been going on for many, many years. And what we understood is that optimal transport is a way to understand how the process of eating, so this movement from a perfect pentagon to an idealized pentagon happens in the eating process. So the map T that I used before to transport, you know, the, the probability measures on E on, on the probability measure of B1, physically, when you think of the of the object E as the in that case was the ball, the ball to which I gave some energy, uh, it would be like a way to embed this heating process in the transport map. So again, it's, the transport map here is a tool. It has nothing to do with the problem itself, but it can be a useful tool. Uh, why am I saying this? I will, I'm also mentioning this because I will not have time later to explain you in a more complete setting how we do it, but this principle also guided us uh, in a work with, on, with Alice Guionet on random matrix theory, where we wanted to understand properties of random matrices, and we wanted to use transport map as a tool to uh, capture some kind of different, uh, here is different shapes, there it was different uh, random matrix models, just to give you um, just an information for the, for the future slides. There is the, always this kind of guiding principle behind it. Um, Okay, what theorem could we prove here? The theorem that we proved in 2010 is that if epsilon is the amount of energy you give to the system, then the shape can change almost by square root epsilon. And uh, this is a sharp result. So this was conjectured more than 100 years ago, uh, and we proved it in full generality. Every dimension, every crystal, it doesn't matter, you get this power with explicit constants as well, and the power epsilon, square root epsilon is optimal. Um, this is a theorem which is independent of the crystal, is independent whether you apply it to crystal, to soap bubbles, to droplets, it's always true. In reality, if you are really in the crystalline world, where crystalline worlds means, you know, flat phases, then we, one can prove better. That's what we proved 10 years later with Zhang, is that the crystalline structure cannot change. So when you add energy to the crystal for smaller energies, if you start from a pentagon, you remain a pentagon. In higher dimension, if you have a cube, you remain almost a cube. Perhaps the sides move a bit, 
but you cannot get wiggly stuff, which is what you observe in nature. You never see a crystal that suddenly becomes wiggly. Uh, it takes a lot of energy to destroy a crystal. It cannot be done with small energy. So there is, uh, you recover this mathematically. Uh, and I just thought, um, so you, I wanted to, again, to emphasize this because it's really a way to see how optimal transport, again, has nothing to do with any of these problems, still it was for us the key tools to solve these problems. Um, this is an example. Now, um, let me give a second example. Uh, this is a, I will go this here very quickly and then we jump to more, uh, let's say, uh, machine learning type topics. So um, there is a very natural, very important model in meteorology, which is uh, looking at front cloud of, uh, let's say, um, atmospheric fronts, how they move. So let's say I, I look at a, cert, a cloud, a certain distance of time, T0, and then I look one millisecond later at the same cloud, just, you know, where points have moved a bit. So clouds are made of many, many points because they're made of water. So you have the, the, mo the molecules of which the clouds are made that uh, are there, there are billions of them. And then you will like, just by looking at the picture of the clouds, you ask yourself, can I predict who went where? So can I just understand from this picture, each dot on the left, to which dot to the right corresponds? Uh, this is not obvious at all because I mean, uh, I don't know that. I just have the full image, but I don't know the individual particles. Uh, but Mike Cullen understood, is a meteorologist in the UK, that in reality, you can do the coloring. You can say which particle corresponds to which. You just need to solve an optimal transport problem. You need to minimize the transportation cost from the points to the left to the points to the right. Uh, which cost uh, x minus y square again, uh, bring a cost, it turns out. Um, great, so it means that I could use optimal transport to solve this problem, to understand the evolution of clouds, and then solve the, the system that is behind this evolution. It's called the semi-geostrophic system. Um, this was almost the case, but not so true. The difficulty is that uh, once you know the evolution of the particles, you need to reconstruct out of them the, the velocity fields and the pressure field, which are the usually macroscopical quantities you have in a kind of these kind of equations. And this process of building back velocity and pressure uh, looked uh, highly non-trivial because some theorems of optimal transport were missing. So the optimal transport theory was not developed yet enough um, for, for us to understand how to reconstruct velocity and pressure out of this procedure. So this was for 20 years, it was unclear how to prove the theorem, how to prove this result. And it was, everything was about studying this kind of PDE that I wrote here. This is the same PDE for transport maps. You remember the PDE for transport map is the great determinant of the gradient of T equals something. And you just plug T equal greater than phi. So uh, if you use that the transport map is the gradient of a convex function, which is what Brignier tells us, you get this equation. And this is a, a nonlinear PDE, which is extremely difficult to study, but this is the, at the core of optimal transport theory. And uh, so uh, when I, 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 this problem has been around for many, many years, beginning of the nineties, I personally started to encounter it and work on it in 2005. But I tried many, many things, uh, also with friends, with colleagues, and every time we'll get stuck. So we knew what theorem we wanted to prove. We wanted to reach the top of the mountain. Uh, we were trying to look for paths to go to the top. And every time we tried, we got stuck. Uh, sometimes we just were not persistent enough. We had to push a bit more. But even when we pushed more, then we, again, we got stuck over and over and we had sometimes to go back and start again. So it was really like trying to climb a mountain without knowing which path would lead us to the mountain if ever we will reach the top. Um, luckily, after seven years, we managed uh, with Guido de Filippis and uh, we managed to develop this theory for optimal transport that then allowed us to really solve the semi-geostrophic system. So there has been a series of work with, uh, with, with, with him and then also with Ambrosio and Colombo. 
so this is just to say, um, to show you another example of problem where you can solve equation from fluid dynamics. Here it is meteorology, but it looks like fluid equations using optimal transport. Um, okay, now let me try to go a bit more to the present. This is uh, not so close present. Let's go now closer and closer to the present. The first example I, I would like to mention is in random matrices. Um, so random matrices, of course, uh, are very well known in mathematics and also in physics. They have been introduced since the 1950s and they were used in nuclear physics. But now they're also very natural even in random matrices, in the metric, in um, sorry, neural networks. Because perhaps when you have very large networks, for instance, you would like to use, you want to initialize the weight in your neural network, right? So you have these layers in your network, you have all the um, connection between the different neurons, but you need to choose the intensity of the connection. So you need to choose the weight that tells you how each neuron is connected to another one. And um, um, so right now, using random weights, especially at, at the initialization stage, is very natural. And then you would like to understand the properties of these random matrices for very large dimensions. So if you have a lot, a lot of, uh, let's say, so this matrix is like giving you the, the weight, the, in this case would be like the intensity of the weights, these are random. And you like to understand the properties as the number of neurons goes to infinity in some sense, because this is how you, what you do. The idea is that as the number increases, this randomness gets more and more, um, not deterministic, but let's say there are properties that become more and more robust. It's like all this classical principle of probability, uh, central limit theorem, uh, uh, lower large numbers. I don't know, you have a lot of, once you have a randomness, but you have many elements, then you can extract some deterministic kind, type informations. Here um, in random matrices, what matters is the law of the coefficients of your matrix. There are situations where you choose the coefficients random of your large matrix, but in a way where it's easier to do things, like for instance, if you choose everything to be Gaussian, there are a lot of tools to study them. But the moment your model changes, then things get tricky. And here with Alice Guionet, we, sorry, we used, um, we are able to study models that were not uh, um, understood before, how by taking the, 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 the random matrix, the complicated random matrix, so the one for which the law of the coefficient is complicated, use transform theory to, to transport this law of the, of the coefficients into, into a law that we know how to treat. You know, optimal transport is done to transport probability densities. So you can just take the law of the coefficient and just transport it to a better law. And then try to uh, put all the difficulties of the problem into the transport map. So when you do the change of variable with the transport map, the law becomes super nice. Very quickly, you choose the law you want on the coefficient. So very often you choose the Gaussian because you know how to study the Gaussian laws. But then uh, all the difficulties are they're still there. They are in the, hidden in the transport map. So you need then to study the properties of this map to extract the information of the original law. So uh, this is just to mention one uh, direction where um, optimal, another, I would say rather surprising direction where optimal transport has been used. And now more and more actually there are studies which try to push forward this even more uh, by doing optimal transport in um, what's called in a non-commutative setting. So the space of matrices is a non-commutative space. And so you need to transport non-commutative object. This is still, uh, an important topic of research in optimal transport. Um, but there are other directions which are probably more familiar to some of you, like uh, when, about GANs. So GANs is a, is a tool which is um, by now also very fashionable. It has a lot of applications. I was uh, looking recently, for instance, in um, um, medical imaging. It's very, very important, are very important GANs because there are situations where you don't have enough data and you want to find a way to create new data which are as realistic as possible. So it's a way to increase the number of data when you don't have enough real data. Um, and so what GANS does is the following. You have usually two um, neural networks that compete between each other. One 
trains itself, the generator, um, first is trained to generate, let's say, images. So let's say generates images of dogs. Um, it has been trained for that. And then you have the discriminator, which is supposed to discriminate between images. So Im real images and fake images are sent to the discriminator. And then the discriminator has to say whether the image that is received is true or false. And then every time we give the answer, there is a feedback going back, either telling the discriminator that he did wrong or right, or telling the generator that, uh, you know, it generated a fake sample and the discriminator realized that it was fake. So we had to improve. So it's, it's, a, kind of, it's a kind of, uh, sort of game where they compete against each other and they both try to improve. One becomes better and better at generating and the other one becomes better and better at discriminating. Um, but there is a, this is usually computationally very expensive. So this is one, one thing where GANs are tricky, how to make the process converge rather quickly. And what has been proposed just three years after the original paper by Goodfellow uh, is Wasserstein gun. The Wasserstein gun principle is removing the discriminator and using Wasserstein distances, so transportation cost, as a way to discriminate measures. So the idea is that you have the real sample is represented by the measure new, so these are the real images. Um, new theta represents the, uh, the generated samples by your neural network. They depend on a parameter theta because theta represents essentially the, the parameter space of your network that you try to optimize to get your, uh, uh, the samples that you are creating bet closer and closer to the real images. And then what you are trying to do is simply to minimize over theta the transportation cost between mu theta and nu. So it means I want to make my measure mu theta, so the, the mu theta represents the, the, the fake images, as close as possible to, to the set of real images. And it's a minimization problem uh, with respect to transportation cost. So this um, is the idea of Wasserstein gun, essentially use uh, optimal transport distance as a loss function. Um, and there have been many, many variants of it over the last years. There are a lot of still, there is still a lot of work there. But this is just to say that, you know, uh, optimal transport was done to transport you know, uh, material. Then I told you, you can transport probability measures. So you can transport everything, it's very abstract. You can transport images. If you think of images as composed by pixels, you can always represent them as probability measures. So uh, there are many ways. Of course, here the cost function makes a difference. So the, if you change the cost function, the optimization problem changes. Um, I don't think there is a particular cost function that works better than other. In the original paper of Wasserstein Gan, uh, people use the Monge cost, so cost equal distance. I think any reasonable cost should give you a good measure of optimality. But I will come back to this later, anyhow, about the, the, this problem, about open problems, which are, I think, very interesting. So um, this is a Wasserstein Gan. Going forward, still in time, so we here we are in 2017. The previous example with DNA was 2016. Now let me go to 2019. Um, single cell genomics. This is another uh, area more between, uh, um, I mean, with an application to also to biology. Uh, but I think the principle is very, very general. So it, it doesn't limit to that. The idea is this. In, um, what happens is that if you give me a cell, a bunch of cells at certain instant of time, T1. What we know is that cells over time um, evolve. So uh, there is differentiation of cells during development. So you start from a certain type of cells, then maybe one day later, you observe the cells again, and they're not the same kind. And two days later, you sell them again, and they're different. Sometimes we know that cells evolve, and for instance, there, is, there are tumors that can, be, can form. You know, that's cellular differentiation. So there are many biological processes where cells evolve in time. And what you do, what you're allowed to do is to take a bit of snapshots of these cells. So a different, let's say every day I can observe the cells and get a sense of what kind of cells I have. This is usually tricky. The reason is that in, in this problem is very tricky because when you observe a cell, you kill it. So in reality, you can never observe the full set of data. 
You can just take a few of them, you, knowing that, hoping that they will be representative. And you know, the, the more you observe them, they die. Um, but let's say you get a good sense over time of the kind of cells you're observing. And then the question is, can you understand the evolution in between? So if I look at just the snapshots, can I know the path that guided cell differentiation over time? So this is what is called now Waddington optimal transport. So there is a model in single cell genomics, which is called the Waddington landscape model, which is the idea of the picture that there is a landscape that guides cell differentiation. But the idea is to do optimal transport to kind of really interpolate and connect the different dots over time. So optimal transport is, should be the tool to identify the trajectories of the cells from the sample that we obtain from the samples. Um, this is also natural, right? So if optimal transport is what? Optimal transport tells you this point X goes to this point T of X. But then once I know X goes to T of X, I can even just draw a line between the two and think that the particle follow that line in between. So it's a very natural tool. Um, so this is just a, a, a picture that if any of you have some familiarity with cells evolution, will understand what are these codes, like MEF, stromal, placental, neural, blah, blah, blah. But just to, to show you that you know, it has been used, they give very nice uh, results. So depending on the intensity of the color, so the colors change over days. So day zero is the bottom one, day zero is MEF, and then they evolve over time. And the intensity tells you that the probability of having such a trajectory is very high. When the, the color is very uh, you know, light, there is almost no color, it means that you, you think that the, there is a low probability that the particles pass through that evolution. But it, this is a, just a, represent, uh, a representation of it, um, just to show you uh, what kind of, kind of the images you get out of this. This is really, uh, this, is, this picture is from the, it's actually one of the first works of uh, Schiebinger. Uh, by now, there has been a lot of work going on, and more and more people actually got interested in this. Also, now more uh, not only on the biology side, but I think also the uh, med medical, uh, uh, say, pharmaceutical world. Um, now, going on, these are tools that have been developed. Questions. Let's ask some questions about optimal transport. Uh, fundamental questions that we we still don't know really how to answer. So let's say that uh, I want to solve optimal transport. I need to do that if I want to apply to a concrete problem. So let's say I discretize my problem. I have n points and points. How much does it, does it cost me to transport a, a measure supported on n points to a measure supported on n points? So if you just use Kantorovich formulation, this, the formulation of Kantorovich makes it a convex optimization problem. You can use linear programming, um, you can solve it roughly in n cube time. So the computational complexity is usually n cube, the standard one. Uh, the problem is that if n is a thousand, you're happy. But if you're trying to do stuff with, uh, for instance, images where the number of data is probably millions, n cube starts to get big, uh, too big. Uh, and now, now in most applications, n cube, I mean, is really out of question, it's too much. So the goal would be to push this power down. Ideally, people would like to go all the way to one, essentially linear computational cost. Uh, we're very far from there. What was one big breakthrough introduced by Kuduri and Pere um, is the idea of using what's called entropic regularization. So the idea of entropic regularization is that you don't solve the optimal transport problem. So you see this picture where you have mu and nu on the two axes. And solving optimal transport corresponds like to find a map, or let's say the, the, the blue line that is drawn there represents the, the optimal graph. So solving optimal transport corresponds to find a map. So a sort of one-to-one -one correspondence between points in X and points in Y. Um, this is kind of a Monge problem or also Kantorovich problem. Instead, you put a, a, a regularization parameter in Kantorovich formulation. So you, have an eps, you add an epsilon parameter which makes the problem a bit noisy, but being noisy, it's easier to solve, okay? So in reality, you never solve the optimal transport problem, you solve a regularized problem. Still, 
if the if the regularization strength is not too big, you're gonna get a number which is comparably close to the number you wanted, the total the real cost, and it's much quicker to compute. So essentially, you go down roughly to n square. Um, that's great. There has been a big, big, big improvement in this problem. Um, and it had a lot of applications so far. I mean, many people now in the numerical um, optical transport use this entropic regularization. Um, and then they try to see if in some cases it can even be pushed to, to be better if you have extra symmetries or whatever. Uh, as I said, unfortunately, um, I spoke many times with Couture and Pere, yeah, then doesn't give yet what you would like. One power less still is missing. Uh, that would be a fantastic breakthrough, which is still uh, far from uh, being achieved. But um, I don't know, there is a lot of people who are trying to work on that and try to optimize one way or another this kind of uh, methods. Uh, another two more things. Um, where you see optimal transport, so um, let me just look at a single layer neural network. So you have the input layer. Let's say the output is just one, one value. So let's forget the output for a moment. Let's say I have only one layer in between, the inner layer. And then theta i represent the weights of the connection between the, the input layer and the hidden layer. So you have the, all these numbers theta i. And you would like to train them. So you would like to train the network. So you would like to up upgrade this theta i to train your network to do something. Um, there is a way to embed these numbers into a property measure. How? You construct a measure mu, which is 1 over n, sum over i of delta theta i. So you, you build a measure supported where you put a white delta at the values theta i that you use in your uh, network. And then you try to, so of course you need a lot of symmetries here. And then you, instead of training the number theta one to theta n, you train the, the measure. So you, you make the measure evolve. And then you ask yourself, okay, if I was doing a, a, tra a classical training of a linear network with loss function, uh, you know, standard L2 type loss functions, how, what, what would correspond to the evolution of theta i it read at the level of mu. So can I read the evolution of the tie at the level of the measure mu? Uh, you can, it becomes a PDE, which is of this form. Um, essentially you have the, the derivative in time of mu t is equal to the divergence of the gradient of the variation of the loss function evaluated at mu t. It looks like a fancy formulation, a fancy formula, which is perhaps not so appealing. In reality, this is what we call the uh, vast extent gradient flows or optimal transport gradient flows in the optimal transport community. So it's a, it's a PDE that people have been studying optimal transport for 20 years. This can, these, these kind of PDEs are very well understood in the optimal transport community. So this to say that for single layer neural network, there have been at least three papers discussing this in different forms. There is a way to think of the optimization problem, not at the level of weights, at the level of measures, and this gives a theory which is very robust because it, uh, um, it provides estimates of convergence independent of the size of the network. Of course, there is a downside. It's for one single layer. Uh, that, that's a bit strict, strict as a restriction. So at the moment, this is a, a, a beautiful open problem, how to recast the training of multi-layer neural network also into this framework or in a more complicated famous, but still of this kind of sort. Um, and this is a, another question. And just to conclude my last slide, uh, I mentioned you before, like in Vassest and GAN, that a lot of training problem in machine learning are essentially of this form. You minimize over theta the, a loss function, which could be the transportation cost between your model data distribution and the probability measures that you're generating. Um, via your, I don't know, neural network, for instance. And uh, you have a training, which is minimizing over theta this cost. And usually this is a non-convex problem. So it's very difficult to do training. You do, you, the techniques are usually gradient flows, maybe discrete gradient flows. But the fact that this is a non-convex non problem makes the convergence challenging and usually slow. 
it turns out in some examples um, observed by a variety of people, there are many situations where you, you run numerically this kind of gradient flow at the level of optimal transport. So with optimal transport cost instead of L2 loss functions, and the convergence looks rather good, rather fast. So it converges essentially as fast as if it was a convex problem, which is, is unclear why. Um, and it will, it's a very important question also to try to understand wh whether there is something theoretically behind it that could explain why it seems that at the optimal transport level, for certain kind of optimization problem of this form, the convergence goes so, so quickly, despite knowing that the problem is not convex. Uh, so this will have a connection to a variety of problems. I mentioned Vasses and Gun, but then there are other optimization problems. Of course, it's a mac macro problem, but I think it's a, another fundamental theoretical problem that could lead to a variety of applications. So I think my time now is over. It's, almost, it's 2 p.m. in here in Zurich. So I, I thank you very much for your attention. Uh, and uh, here is yeah, this is a thank picture you, of Zurich. Uh, I think it was very clear. I think you, you made it at the right level. And I think people were highly interest, interested by that. You have to know that one of the, uh, one of the use cases that triggered my interest in optimal transport uh, many years ago was in what we call the user base station association problem, where you have a lot of devices, you have a lot of antennas. And basically, uh, there's a big problem in terms of how you associate each user to which base station or multiple mm -hmm. users to multiple base station. And this, in fact, turned out to be a very interesting problem that can be cast into an optimal transport problem where you have a co cost, which is inversely to the, proportional to the distance square, and where then you can find how to optimally with doing empirical measures of both in terms of how you can connect the things. And that is a way of, of course, uh, uh, deploying better the resources towards mini Wi-Fi hotspots. So um, it, it turned out to be quite good. One of the big things that you, you mentioned was about, of course, solving. Uh, I, I mean, in the continuous setting, it's very nice. You write it down and then, then you need the computational part to solve it and, 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 and have the numerics. But it was, now you have computational solvers, especially by Gabriel Perret and others mm -hmm. who have been working a lot on, on all what we call computational optimal transport. And the software now is quite available to make it work. Uh, so what I'll do right now is go to the, some questions of the audience. So the audience can ask questions. Unfortunately, I think you can only write them at the moment. And so don't hesitate to write the questions you have. So um, let me go on one question of Eliseo. He says, in the GAN example, if you improve the discriminator, so that's in the chat. I'm, I'm going down mm -hmm. and up. Yes. With, with the optimal transport, uh, the initial improvement with respect to classical optimization, doesn't this create an unfair imbalance between the discriminator and the generator, which may jeopardize the original purpose of GAN? They have this arms race in which at the end they achieve a useful result for the given application. Was it shown that the original purpose of the GAN is still maintained with this change or even improved? Yeah, so uh, thanks for the question. Of course, it depends what's your goal. So if you want, if you are interested both in the generator and the discriminator, where you want to train kind of both of them, of course, yes, you, you're missing the, the original purpose. If your goal is just to improve the generator, so you just want a way to, to get better and, a better and better way to generate samples which are as faithful as possible, then in a sense, you just forget about the discriminator. So the optimal transport becomes your discriminating quantity. And uh, that's the one, so there is no the gen, gen, um, discriminator anymore. Um, the advantage is that it can make, can be made to converge quicker than maybe a standard gun. On the other end, um, it doesn't does, of course, it doesn't fit the original purpose if you wanted to train both of them. So it really depends on the problems. Uh, that's really what you're looking for. But uh, you're perfectly right that, you know, it's, uh, it's not a clear gain. It depends what you want to do. And it's not also a clear gain in general. I mean, what kind of cost you should use also makes a big difference. This is still part of debate. Uh, is there a choice of cost for which the Vasses and GAN perform better? It's still to be understood because this kind of cost, the choice of cost is always 
the big problem in all these things. Even in the cell genomics, you say, are you going to use optimal transport to, uh, to, to complete the trajectories? But if you change the cost, the, the trajectory changes. Which one is the right one? Uh, the cost. Uh, what people now are trying to do is to, to put the cost inside the neural network itself. So to have a one parameter family of cost depending on theta. And when you, as you train your network, you train also the cost. <laughs> so you put that as part of the training process itself in such a way to get the one which better fit the data. And then you guess within a reasonable class of cost, which one is working the best in the problem. So th there is an act of fate, which is, I believe optimal transport is there. And then there is either you have a reason to believe that some cost works better, or you could try to embed the cost in the training process. And that's also a very good uh, tool that many people are using right now, actually, like also Kuturi, Peredis, people, they, uh, in a lot of problems, they, they train the cost itself. Yeah, of course, you can learn the cost. I mean, yeah, definitely, that's, that's a good way. Uh, another question is, a transport, I don't know if it's a question or a comment. So a transport map uses the property of cost of transport from one segment of a possible connections between the two points. In a computer backplane, you have the two types, uh, the two type of cost, cost type of latency and the cost type of throughput. So I think uh, uh, this is more maybe a comment just in mapping yeah. uh, basically yes. the, the approach you're doing. Now the comment about- yeah, I... uh, Sorry, please. Yeah, maybe you have some comments on this. Um, well, I agree that, of course, the kind of cost could be of different type, right? So here is really the cost between this, as you say, the, co the cost of putting a segment in some sense between the two points. Of course, there could be latency cost and other kind of cost. Uh, you could technically embed all of them. So the, the most problem or the counter which problem is just one kind of transportation cost problems. For instance, I told you in the picture that in biology, you could use transport problem, transportation theory um, to uh, model, you know, transportation theory to model like um, biological structures. For instance, you could use it to model the, the hair, the, um, the, the whole um, circular system in a body. It's not gonna be a much problem because you have to model things in a way that, you know, uh, things tend to, to flow together. So if you have a lot of blood that has to go together, you will have a big artery that will do the job. And uh, this doesn't fit neither in Kantorovich nor in Monge, but it's still an optimal a cost problem that people like uh, um, Jean-Michel Morel uh, in Paris and uh, Filippo Sant'Ambrogio and many other people worked on. So they used what is called branched optimal transport, where you have the, the branching phenomena. So just to say, Optimal transport is a bigger macro area than what I presented today. What I presented today was really the classical optimal transport, but you can make the, the cost, make it appear even as you say, if there are costs that appears on the process, like maybe you have a latency cost or stuff, you could incorporate that in, the, in a transport problem. Perhaps you need a model which is a bit more complex than, than simply transport maps or random variables. But in general, most of this stuff can be done. Okay, so there was then a comment called on um, deep reinforcement learning may solve this problem. So maybe that's more a, a, a general question. I mean, uh, if you feel like to respond, it's okay. Otherwise, we can go to the two other comments. Uh, yeah, I wouldn't know how. Uh, maybe. Okay. Uh, uh, I mean, solving the problem, uh, it's a matter. I mean, maybe you can solve, but the question is how quickly you solve it, right? I mean, it's a uh, in optimal transport, so it depends which problem, right? Kantorovich, you can always solve it, and cube in the number of points. The problem with Monsch is that there could be no solution. It could, the set of solution could be empty, and that's a tricky part. So that's why we work with Kantorovich. Uh, but of course, then the tools and improving the speed, uh, I agree that I think there is a lot of margin there. Um, then and then I see that uh, there has been a reply that say, thank you, so maybe he was happy with the answer. <laughs> it's the yeah, same so person as the also asking you how to optimize the backplane architecture given the dynamic compute load of the compute nodes because with FPGA we can have a liquid backplane so I don't know if you, if you're I mean you're in, into that but uh, if not it's okay it's yeah I'm, I should look exactly what are the I'm not an expert of the, this particular topic so I wouldn't know how to answer uh, on the spot but I, I, I'm confident maybe having a chat uh, one could easily incorporate all these kind of uh, 
um, models. It's a matter of sometimes of changing a bit the, the formulation. It's not usually super difficult to add uh, loading cost or stuff in this kind of problems. There are tools. Okay, now we have the last uh, question from Omar. Uh, so that's a question in the Q&A. Can we model yep. the system geometrically by considering it as a manifold and solving the optimization problem as a geodesic problem? In other words, the optimal solution would correspond to a geodesic on the manifold. Very nice, yes. Um, there is a sort of way to do that. Uh, this is a bit, so it depends on the cost again. So if you take the quadratic cost, which is the more Hilbertian type cost, so where you have really a scalar product, uh, so a structure which is very much Riemannian manifold type dependent, so you can talk geodesics and so on. Uh, yes, there is a formulation and an interpretation given by Felix Otto 20 years ago that allows to look at you as the optimal transport problem. I mean, as a vast and distance, so the transportation distance is um, a, a, an infinite dimensional manifold. So you have the space of probability measures, which is an infinite dimensional manifold. At each point, you can say, what is the space of tangent vectors along which you can move? And then the, there is um, the so-called Benabrou-Benier formulation that allows you to cast the optimal transport problem as a geodesic problem. So, Great question. You got the uh, is the point. Yes, for quadratic cost, there is that. Uh, Benavou Brenier is also another way to start, uh, very efficient uh, uh, way to study uh, optimal transport with quadratic cost. Um, it's also how you interpret, uh, how you formulate gradient flows in this, in this space. Uh, you have like a Riemannian structure, you can talk about gradient flows. This is what I told you at the very end about these optimal transport gradient flows is through this interpretation. So the answer is yes, uh, at least for quadratic cost and for variance of it. Okay, Alessio, I think we're running out of time. We took, we took more than one hour. I'd like to sincerely thank you on behalf of all the attendees for the time you spent and also for making the effort of, of let's say going down to a level where all the people could have a grasp. I mean, coming from different communities, mathematics, engineering, or computer science. So thank um, you again. And, and for all My the pleasure. others, of course, you can always uh, 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 ping in terms of questions uh, when, you, when you want, Alessio. And, uh, and let's go for the next seminar series, which will take place in, in two weeks or so. Thank you, Alessio. Wonderful. And, no, and my pleasure. Thank you so much. You